welcome to the next edition of Reclaiming My Mind. I am your host, Jessica Vaughn. Today, I am excited because we have with us one of the only female candidates who has come on our show, one of the few that are actually running for city council. Um, we have today, we have our guest uh, who is running in District 3, v- uh, Viba Shave Day. Um, welcome to the show, Viba. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, I'm super excited. Most of my show um, in the beginning were all women. And then I started doing municipal candidates and it's been all men. Not that I don't love the men. Love for the men. <laughs> but it is refreshing to have a woman on. Um, and uh, I said it a little bit a while ago while we were doing the live feed. Um, uh, today, there's been a shakeup or yesterday, actually, where Rob Lorai was uh, let go from WMNF. And there was a huge article about how we have almost no access to politicians or local news at this point and there was actually a quote about who's holding candidates and and elected officials accountable so we just want to remind our listeners that the reason we put so much work into the show is that we're trying to be one of the voices in our community that connects you so for every candidate that comes on especially you you said this was your fourth event today (laughs) running around uh going around town connecting with voters we really appreciate every candidate who comes on so um, what I like to do uh, early on before we kind of jump into the politics is how the candidates tell us about um, about themselves. You know, I know that you're a mom. Um, you live close by me. Tell me a little bit about Viva before we talk about your candidacy. Uh, sure. Um, so I've been married for almost uh, f- 15 years. Wow. And uh, we have three children. Uh, and I have uh, five-year-old twins. Um, one boy, one girl, I have uh, two girls, a boy, a son. And um, I moved to Tampa uh, for USF. I went to University of South Florida. Uh, and uh, I'm from Daytona Beach originally. Uh, I'm an only child. Oh. Uh, I did my um, bachelor's in speech pathology, and I have a master's in organizational management. Hmm. Wow. I like speech pathology. It's something I was interested in myself. Um, So what made you decide to jump into this crazy mess of municipal races and decide that you want to run for city council? Uh, I would like to say it was 2016. (laughs) (laughs) Do you need I say more? (laughs) No, but uh, let me elaborate. So You know, I turned on the TV in 2016 after the election, and I hear adults telling adults to go back where they came from. And uh, that brought back memories of when I was a child um, in Florida and how I was the only one um, that looked different. Mm. And uh, people would tell me to go back where I came from. Mm. So I told my parents that uh, I'm not going to, Not my children, not my neighbor's children, not my friend's children, not my community children. And that is what sparked me uh, to be part of the solution for change. And that is why I'm running. That's one of the best answers I've heard so far. Um, So you felt motivated to to, want to change. And I've really seen, you know, through this election, you start to find your voice as a candidate. Um, So tell me a little bit about your platform. Um, We know a little bit about you, why you decided to run. But tell us a little bit about what you envision for the city of Tampa um, when you're elected. Certainly. I feel I'm the most, um, not only am I the only woman running in a citywide seat, but I add I'm qualified and I have the most experience we need in today's challenges. I've I've worked in transportation. I currently work in housing. Uh, I I work in tech. I worked in technology for a decade. And these are things that we need to. Uh, these are the today's challenges that we face. Um, I've been a public sa- uh, safety advocate with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Advisory Council for the last six years, serving our community, bridging the gap between law enforcement and our community. I've served as president. So I've been a civil servant uh, long before I decided to run for public office. Okay. So you said you're in housing now. What does that mean? I'm currently a real estate agent. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you do have some experience with housing. Um, and tell me a little bit more because I've, I've seen things from the, the advisory council. Um, and I'm not familiar with that organization. So I've always been curious. Tell, tell me a little bit more about it. Certainly. So our, we are the liaison. Um, I also worked in law enforcement. Oh, So wow. I've seen uh, both sides of the coin. Uh-huh. <laughs> 
And um, I decided to move forward and do more by being more involved um, in bridging the gap. You know, dis- discrimination is real. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, very important that we are connected with our community. So what we do is uh, we have, um, depending on the institution, the association, the organization, the clinic, um, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. right? Uh, we'll have uh, we'll have our seminars. We'll have campaigns. I'm very proud of our anti bullying campaign that we host every year. Uh, one third of our students are from the LGBT community, oh. and all um, that we like we have we address because we want to make sure we are there for everyone. And twenty five percent of them are uh, are suicidal. So these are these are at you know these are things that are social issues that people don't talk about that we bring to the table. Another thing we hosted was um, a senior seminar for our seniors in our disabled community mm. how how to be safe, mm. and um, whether you're inside your home or whether you're outside, or um, whether you're just shopping. You know, for example, and that one tip is um, when you sleep. You should keep your key fob with you because it has a panic button. Because you you can't defend yourself right away. And when you press the panic button on your key fob, your car alarm will go off. And that is the first response that will um, be a deterrent mm. for a burglar. So these are things that we try to do. Uh, another seminar we did was about active ready shooterness um, and also about traffic stops. Oh. about being pulled over huh. because we have you know it, this doesn't just affect the african american community this affects minorities as well and we go into these associations and organizations and neighborhoods to bring a positive impact not just to the community on educating your rights or um you know if you get pulled over pull over to the side or you know or if you know an officer knocks on your door you know, it's okay to answer it because we'll have uh, women uh, that won't answer their door if their husbands are not home. Mm. And we don't want them to think that, oh, it's something bad. You know, it might be something that just needs some information. Hey, have you seen this? Or I want to, I mean, you know, it could be anything. You know, sure. it doesn't have, we have a lost cat. You know, it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be something so serious. Right. So we have to work on um, bridging that gap of perception. And it's t- both sides. So not only do we educate and bring awareness to the community, but we educate and bring awareness to our law enforcement on the culturally sensitive issues that no one wants to talk about or address or think they're real. Mm. And this is a great value we bring back to the table that helps law enforcement in their training and in their um, approach when they approach uh, certain situations that they're not accustomed to. So this is what we, these are just a few things we do besides also we sponsor Title I schools and teachers. I mean, now my, the next project that I'm working on is with the clinics. And I'm really excited about this because um, we are going to um, work on something with the clinics for addiction. And I've already met with um, the clinics and you know, I've, I'm also being educated, mm-hmm. you know, because I don't suffer from a, an addiction per, per se, right? Right. So uh, tw- if you are an addict, it doesn't just affect you. It affects 25 people around you. Mm. So they are all part of it. And so that's why the intervention and, the, and uh, being there for all our residents are very important. We, whatever we do in society has an impact on someone else. And we have to be mindful of these things. And we can talk about it all we want, but talk is cheap. Mm. You need action. So if I have always been the type of person, the type of leader who has taken action, and this is why I'm so involved in these things, because I believe in it. Awesome. So you believe in all of these um Issues which are very important that I'm glad people are talking about, especially when it comes to the police, because that's generally one of the questions that I ask. Um, so you feel like you're experienced. Tell me about some more of your visions and or even what you're finding as you're out on the streets, because I know you've been canvassing and talking with people that you're finding constituents are concerned about when it comes to city council. Certainly. Um, the biggest concerns also vary with all the challenges we face in transportation, in housing, in jobs. Jobs, you know, uh, these are the three, I mean, you know, also our climate change, you know, n- not a lot of 
uh, candidates are talking about climate change, but in all my forums, I bring up the fact that we need solar energy. Mm. We need, we don't just need technology driven jobs, but we need green jobs. Right. You know, this is something that we can teach our labor force. Um, the, either the ones that are coming back to work are the ones that are transitioning, that we can teach, we can have apprenticeship programs, and we can bring them a livable wage where they can actually go and af- afford a place that they can call home. See, it's all connected. Mm-hmm. And then I want to bring a transit system to Tampa uh, that will connect all our neighborhoods and not divide us. Um, so I have that experience in transportation with the USF uh shuttle services we started off with like four shuttles and now look at us you know it's successful and it can be at a city level as well you know we can use the csx tracks do you, do you agree with using those tracks yes do you i do that's the good choice yes i do because we're out of that one cent tax that we're going to get we're uh heart is going to take about 40 percent and we the city's going to take 30 so with 30 percent of a cent we have to be uh we have to use that money wisely. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to focus on, um, I want to focus on what we already have and expand that within our neighbors. We already have those tracks. Right. You know, we can build on that and move forward and create a system that works for everyone. Um, and I bring that to the table because I've seen it before. So I know what how to work with Florida Department of Transportation and HART. And, and some of the stories that you did uh, tell me, let me tell you about HART. We have students who have epilepsy that are at the university. This is, um, and I have one of her videos on my uh, Facebook. Um, I true, think I saw that. Yeah, true story. Yeah. She told me, you know, my my son has a uh, seizure, you know, diagnosed with seizures. But besides that, she told me how she uh, heart was cut, and now she spends six hundred dollars on Uber a month to go to campus at various times. And since it's in the middle of semester, it's not like she can pick up and go and cut her, break her lease and find something closer. She has to wait. And also I've talked to a lot of seniors and a lot, and a lot of people from the disabled community. My father is physically disabled. My father-in-law is physically disabled. My, and you told you about my son. So uh, it's very close to my heart uh, to be a voice for our seniors and our disabled community because heart, affected them too. Their, their transit system was cut in regard in their areas where they live and they depend on TRICARE. It's, a, it's not as cheap. And so we have to work on bringing it back for our uh, for uh, the community and for everyone else who d- will depend on it. We are going to be in a crisis when it comes to our vehicles coming up. Right now we have the housing crisis that we're getting over with. Now we're going to be coming in a vehicle crisis because the prices of vehicles have gone up, one. Second, insurance, the maintenance, and now, the, now it's... Um, we have a lot of people, nationally speaking, that are in re- repossession mm-hmm. because of their because of other environmental issues that are affecting them that they can no longer uh, sustain a vehicle. So now we are going that that will affect us. You know, don't think that what happened in Fl- Flint can't happen here. Don't think whatever happened in Houston can't happen here. Don't think whatever happened. Um, at the other schools cannot happen here. We have to be, think of sustainability and we have to plan for the future. And it's very important to have a leader who can look forward and not just put a Band-Aid on things when they don't know what to do Absolutely. at the moment of time. Yeah. So you say that you think we're, tr- we're starting to edge out of the housing crisis or is that still an issue? No, no, we are definitely in a housing crisis <laughs> issue. Here's another story. <laughs> so um, I'll tell you too. Um, I was in a, one of the meetings and I had a wonderful opportunity to meet a young professional and he was telling me how he is on the wait list with the with the housing authority mm-hmm. and he has been on this wait list for 5 years. Wow. So I asked him, "Do you know what number you are?" And he has no idea. He's he has no idea. That's how broken it is. Uh, I'll tell you another story. You know, we talk about housing and we talk about the Sadowski Fund and we talk mm-hmm. about the Challenge Fund. You know, it'll be great to get the Sadowski Fund. That will help us a lot, of course. But also the Challenge Fund, that is a fund that that it used to be very good and it, st- it still is, but we can do better. Now, is that the fund where they would help homeowners for the first time? Mm-hmm. Yes, co- from lo- a city local. level, mm-hmm. city level, yes. And um, so I have a constituent 
who is a retired Army veteran who used, um, went through the Housing Authority and Veteran Affairs, and he found a home in three months. Now, because of the government's federal shutdown that occurred, um, he was funded with HUD. Mm. That was part of his program. So when the government shut down, so did HUD. He had to pay that difference. Wow. And he told me, Viva, if if there's another government shutdown, I'm afraid I'm going to be homeless. Wow. So we don't just need a challenge fund anymore. We need an, um, uh, an emergency fund within an umbrella for our residents because whatever deci- governmental decisions are made impulsively, Impulsively, mm-hmm. impulsively, mm-hmm. Uh, we are prepared. Right. For we, you know, right now we have 3,000 students that are homeless in public schools. So, I'm sure you've heard of that. So. What, one of the things I've had a uh, challenge is candidates being able to put their finger on ways aside. I love the emergency fund idea um, to kind of deal with the crisis, um, the housing crisis. And I have different answers to this, but I'd love to get your take. Um, Do you think that there's a way to encourage developers to make sure that they're including affordable housing in the developments that they're building? And is that something that you see city council having a role in playing? Definitely. So I work with developers too for um, you know, um, for their home buying, mm-hmm. right? So depending on the location, the same exact home will be priced twenty thousand dollars more in one area of Tampa compared to another area of Tampa. That is one situation. Um, they also have within developers, they have a referral a referral program mm-hmm. with certain brokers, which they will give you more of a commission to that broker. You know, we can have a partnership with them and they can give it to the city. Mm -hmm. They can work on the roads. They can build affordable housing. They can be part of the solution instead of us and them. And that is my goal, to have joint ventures and have partnerships in the public and private sectors to make this possible because previous leadership wasn't able to do it on their own. Mm. And so it's time to think outside of the box and be open to new things like... Last month, I attended the East Tampa Association meeting, Mm -hmm. and they had a um, presentation of the container homes. Right. And I'm sure it's widespread about the tiny homes, container homes. Uh, What I uh, admire about the container home is weatherproof. Right. And they come in different sizes, Mm -hmm. and they're stackable. So what that means is you can put it in locations where we need the business, and and you can have a... um, business owner downstairs and you can have um a home upstairs so these are things that we can do that we can look at and we can transition that uh, family or individual to another home right right? but this would be a beginning step to look into Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so I hear that also we're gonna have and we already have but uh one of the the big issues that a lot of city council well there's two that a lot of city council candidates have talked about are one our flood water our storm waters um are in horrible shape and we're talking about climate change and we're talking about you know managing summer storms when our storm water uh drainage is corroding from what i hear and falling apart so we're looking at areas flooding and serious damage um as well as you know bonds coming due and um city council in the next two years having the budget be restricted even more so it seems such a concern when we have so much infrastructure issues along with a shrinking budget of how we're going to be able to address what's the biggest priority what do you feel like is an answer to that or issue Issues that we should address with a shrinking budget and crumbling infrastructure. Okay, so I'll I'll, I'll make it a two part thing. First part was <laughs> the climate change that right. I mentioned earlier. So uh, with that, they the city spent two hundred fifty million dollars on stormwater, but they didn't take in consideration in the account of the sea level rising. Mm-hmm. There's twenty five uh, cities currently in t- uh, Florida that are part of an association to address this climate change. I want Tampa to be on that table. 
Nice. I want Tampa to be in that conversation, and I want to bring Tampa in it. Um, you know, McDill Air Force is at mm-hmm. risk. We have the, um, Tampa General. I'm, I mean, if you, we don't address this, by the way, I own a Prius. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Li- it's the little Shh. things we do <laughs> to make the greatest impact. <laughs> but um, if we don't address these issues today, then 30 years from now, mm-hmm. we might not have a Bayshore to call beautiful. Right. You know, that is going to affect the housing market all over. Mm-hmm. And and it's very important to introduce ordinances that are green friendly, that have uh, solar, that we have um, more um, s- plants mm-hmm. and trees and canopies. To abs- canopies yeah. Thank you to absorb these um from a catastrophe to happen. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the, I mean, the budget, let me just move into the budget part. (laughs) If you look at the doc stamps, the smallest percentage of your money that you pay in your doc stamps goes to parks and recreation. What that tells us is environment is not a number one priority. That's the bottom line. It's not a priority. Mm. And we need to uh, for the budget balancing or addressing the budget on what our needs are, mm-hmm. we need to relook at what our real our real needs are and focus more on the people and the environment and um, readjust where we allocate our money starting from the beginning with the doc stamps. I've had the experience working on two hundred fifty million plus dollar budgets in corporate America, handling their compliance, their quality control, and shaving off the backlog. Currently, city council has a backlog in transportation. I know how to shave that backlog off by making public safety a priority, Mm. by putting in those sidewalks, putting in those crosswalks, giving our students adequate lighting, especially now when you don't have a school bus in around a two-mile radius to come for you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I have kind of an interesting question. Um, recently, one of the candidates um, made the headlines because they said that women have an advantage uh, in politics today. Um, and I was wondering, basing, based on your experiences on the campaign trail, do you find that to be true? Do you feel like being a woman has given you an advantage on the campaign trail? Um, tell me a little bit about that. It's a very interesting question <laughs> because in paper, I feel like I am under uh, underrepresented mm. than my counterparts. Mm-hmm. Um, they don't say I'm an advocate for public safety. They don't say the first three things that come out of my mouth when I'm at a forum. They always label me as something. Um, and uh, I find it very, uh, I find being a woman, mm-hmm. you have to work twice as hard. Mm. And um, if I wasn't qualified and I wasn't ready, I wouldn't run. Right. And so I'm very confident that I hold the whole package of, with an experience, um, leadership, that I can move Tampa forward. Oh, I like confidence. <laughs> what have you found to be your biggest challenge on the campaign trail so far? Not enough hours in the day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I can imagine. Not enough hours in the day. Um, That is my biggest challenge. We have less than two weeks. Yeah, and And you guys are um, running everywhere. uh, And uh, I'm very excited. And I'm very, uh, if elected, I'm going to be very honored to serve. When elected, that's what you're supposed to say, right? when I'm elected. (laughs) When elected. Um, All right. Um, Before I kind of talk about some of the lightning round issues that I like to ask my guests about, is there anything else that you kind of want to talk about that we haven't touched on on your platform? I'll give you some more time at the end, but I don't want to shift too quickly. Is there anything else you want to kind of address? Um, Yes, I want to address our graduates. Um, or, um, so if you're, you know, when I say technology driven jobs mm-hmm. and green jobs, I don't mean to work in the technology field. I mean, when you graduate from high school or college or wherever, right. it doesn't have to be college, you have the same opportunities as you do, um, in Atlanta or, or in California, or you have a potential to have the same opportunities where you can actually find a livable wage. You know, I am for the fight for 15. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you you know, and unfortunately, I, I hate to uh, say this, but 
you know, the current minimum wage right now is 20% below a poverty line, mm-hmm. you know. So f- to give someone minimum wage right now, you're forcing them to take a, a second job and you're forcing them to not be with their family or loved ones. Mm-hmm. And um, it's a... and um, So when I say about technology, I want to tell you that um, to work with the companies to come here, to work also with the small business owners, especially the women and our minorities, because they are... Uh, let me give you an example. Tampa is the highest um, in women business owners are on the rise in Tampa. We have 136,000 women business owners. However, in the state of Florida, we are ranked the lowest mm-hmm. for women equality. Interesting. What does that mean? Is that we are not being we're not getting the adequate funding we need when we want to have our small business a business mm-hmm. as our counterparts. Um, you know, you have the Channel Side or I mean City Walk. The highest bidder for that was a minority, but they weren't had they didn't have the opportunity to be at the table. So we should start. We need to include everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, City Council should be a representation of its people uh, because Tampa is a city for everyone. And right now, if you look at city council, it doesn't look like Tampa. Right, for sure. For, you know, about the saving money for our budget, Uh if we use technology and streamline our processes, we will save money. If we automate our systems within the city, we will save money. That Mm -hmm. will all go towards our fiscal debt. Right. If we train you know, bring uh, people that are c- coming back into the workforce. If we train them, that will boost our economy. If we have livable wages, you know, MetLife has just opened 500 jobs in Tampa. Cognizant is a staffing company. They just um, had a hub here. So these are things that are actually happening that we need to boost and bring about so we can keep our talent. So I just wanted to give you some facts. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I was going to ask about the fight for fifteen, but I don't need to. Oh yes, you, you clearly, you clearly yeah. said that that was something that you were for. Um, as we're kind of talking about bringing new jobs um, here, what it makes me wonder about is, and we're talking about level wage is workers' rights and unions. It's always something I like to ask about because I do feel like there is an attack on organized labor in general that's been so important um Um, always tell me about your relationship with the unions and kind of where you stand as far as supporting unions and workers rights when we're talking about you know the workforce i support it 100 percent you know i i feel that uh health care is very important every employee deserves to have health care um personally being with parents who have been sick all my life I see the struggles they face. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, uh, my father lost his job. And the first thing he told me was, I'm sorry, Viva, I won't be able to pay for your college. You're on your own on that one. Right after that, since he lost his job, he lost his health insurance. We lost our home, and he had a heart attack. Wow. So can you just imagine the bill? I can't imagine any of that. So uh so that that was something that you you cannot forget where you come from. Right. So unions are a family. And um during my meeting with the unions, I feel that it's very important that they have a voice at the table, especially when we have new ordinances for development that involve businesses. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we should have, create some sort of union-based voice in City Hall. So it doesn't matter what leader is there for four years that comes and goes, their voice will remain always. And so they don't have to run around every election time to find someone that that can be their voice. They will already have their voice. Yes. Um, so it sounds like I don't really have to ask you about healthcare as a human right, which I like to do. Um, but it sounds like you're a healthcare advocate. Do you believe that? Oh yes, Medicare I si- for all is the solution. Yes, I do. I signed the petition Yay. and I posted it on my Facebook page that I have extra petitions. If anyone would like to sign, I can get it delivered to you. Oh, because I know it's due in the, the month. Yeah, I'm actually hitting the getting out this weekend. We've had the plague here, and I'm getting out, and I'm gonna. 
get 50 of those signed Wonderful. one way or another this weekend. But um, okay, so let's talk about um, adult use marijuana. <laughs> I am for it 100%. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and um also I liked the idea, you know, for the re- regulating every aspect of it, but I also heard other candidates um through the forums mm-hmm. and I like their idea about taxing it. Yes. Yeah. I like that idea. Yeah, we can make some revenue off yes. that. Um what about I know that there's been um, you know, a lot of talk. We've uh had endorsements come out and I know that the LGBTA um has done in some endorsements and I've talked to some of the members of the the LGBTA caucus, and they really are trying to make sure that they're represented, you know, um, within our community. Would you say that you're an advocate for the LGBTAQ community? Uh, absolutely, I do attend. I did att- attend their meetings. Also, like I mentioned in the beginning, how one third of our youth. Um, that are bullied right. are from the LGBTA community. Yeah. So it's very important to be there for everyone. Um, okay, what about separation of church and state? Tell me a little bit about that one. That's the one that I've gotten the most interesting answers um, on my show regarding. Well, I believe in separation of church and state. <laughs> <laughs> You're making it so easy, Biba. You're making this all so easy, giving straightforward answers, I, committing to things. Um Okay, so <laughs> let's see what else is here. Um, how about now, again, this is something that... Um, I mean, it's not technically something that city council has reign over, but public education, charter school movement, privatization is a tr- it's a tricky it's a tricky um, subject these days because with the attack on our public schools, so many communities just don't feel like they have a, another choice, um, you know, and it's almost like they're forcing um, communities to feel because they've, you know, underfunded and understaffed public education for so long. These communities feel like charter schools are the only salvation that they have. And it's this kind of, you know, nasty trick that's being played. And it's, you know, eroding the one right that we have, you know, as Americans to public education. So even though you know technically city council doesn't um oversee that because we have a school board although that you can have some zoning decisions would you say that you know uh, supporting public education um and the attack on public education in lieu of um for-profit charter schools is an issue that you care about yes certainly um i wanted to say 90 percent of our students attend public schools so the priority in funding from a city council perspective, would go towards public schools. Um, we don't have control over public schools. That's Hillsborough County Schools. However, what we do have control over is to make sure that the children and the families that are walking on the sidewalk to school is there. Mm-hmm. They have the sidewalks. They have the adequate lighting. They have the crosswalks. And having worked providing speech therapy in Title I schools because that's what I believe everyone should have equal opportunity to a good education. And I thought I was the best speech therapist in town. (laughs) So um, I chose to work there. I saw at firsthand the challenges that our teachers and students face. And unfortunately, I see it again after years of leadership coming Mm -hmm. by. And um, I would be definitely an advocate for our children and our teachers. And public schools? And public schools. (laughs) And but I would not take away existing funding from charter schools. Um, Let me ask you a little bit about gun reform. How important do you think gun reform is in in politics these days? Very important. Uh, So let me tell you a statistic. One woman in Tampa, er, in the Tampa Bay area, dies every month from gun violence. With that, that also stems from um, domestic violence. Mm-hmm. One, um, one third cause of death from children age one to seventeen is from gun violence. We will have to work with the state and the county in tightening regulations for our children. My children attend public schools, and now with the school system, they are going to be having once a month active readiness shooter drills 
where they are going to be conditioned that when the lights are off, that they have to be quiet and hide. They are in kindergarten. Yeah, I do them in kindergarten. They're not fun. So I don't want that to come to my home where if I turn the lights off, I think that that's what they need to do. And it's 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 serious, you know. It's gonna it and like I said, don't think what happened in other cities and st- states can happen to us. We have to uh, look at this very seriously. We have ma- moms, de- you know, demand action, mm-hmm. and we also have um, there's the students demand action that was founded in Hillsborough County as well. Um, that you know, students are now having a voice in Hillsborough County too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tell me a little bit about and um, we can't technically be a sanctuary city but you know um you've talked about part of being motivated is because you saw kind of the backlash against you know immigration or and and said from personal experience you know that you were told to you know go back to wherever you came from so it sounds like immigration is something that's near and dear to your heart um do you think that we should have a, a, a different approach to immigration than we kind of see in the national climate right now uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I have no control over immigration Absolutely. as a city level. Um, my, pa- you know, my my parents are immigrants, mm-hmm. and um, with the way the sanctuary, sanctuary city is is between law enforcement and the federal right. FBI, and being with uh, under Chad Sheriff Chronister, mm-hmm. um, he's not the I don't want to speak for him, sure, but he's not the kind of person that is going to keep you in jail and wait for someone to take you away. So generally what I like to talk about at the end is, you know, um, criminal justice, racial justice. You know, um, one of the things that um, I think progressives really advocate for is, you know, racial equality and criminal justice reform because the two are go hand in hand. Um, Tell me a little bit about how you see the issues in Tampa when we are talking about discrimination, um, criminal justice reform, and racial equality, and how we can improve things in Tampa, especially as an elected official. Uh, I will give you an example of my first time being exposed to the juvenile justice system. I was doing a social studies project in high school where I went to court and I had a 20, I think, 20-question 20 questionnaire for juveniles. On My project was on the big why. Why are they here and I'm not there, pretty much, right? Uh, why did they commit the crime? What was the crime? Um, th- those were some of the questions that I that were presented to them, as well as, what their favorite food was, what they do for fun, who they live with, and what they want to be when they grow up. Um, so I presented this project um, to the judge. He, he didn't smile at all, so I was very intimidated. And, and he let me proceed. So I, in my project, I interviewed dozens of students like myself, the youngest being nine years old. And um, towards the end of my um, project, the judge called me in his chambers, and I was like, oh, my gosh, am I in trouble? (laughs) And I wasn't. Uh, He said, okay, let's go through the questions. And so I said, okay. So one by one, we went through the questions, and um, he was very enlightened. And on top of it, he asked me, what do you think we should do about this one? And uh, I said, I think you should give him a second chance, I think you should let him go. He goes, yeah, I agree. Um, And he reduced the sentence to community service. The judge smiled and thanked me because behind the bench, he doesn't have the opportunity from the lawyers to find out the why and the background of the child on, on their environmental situation on how they got there. He misses that part. He is only given the facts Mm -hmm. on the date, time, what happened. Now what's the next step? And he thanked me and he also said he will incorporate those, uh, those, um, some of these questions to the lawyers, prosecutors for future decisions. I think that 
uh, really opened my eyes on how broken the juvenile justice system is Mm -hmm. and uh, how one person can make an impact in a a small courtroom. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was, I learned a lot from that experience. And when you talk about juvenile justice, it is not fair. Discrimination is real. And that is why I feel it's very important that we have a time for change by diversifying leadership. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that way everyone has an opportunity to have a voice at the table. Everyone has an opportunity to be part of the conversation so change can really happen. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, especially with working, you say, as a liaison between law enforcement, do you think that there are issues like you talk about training and making sure that you're uh, exposing them to situations um, outside of an escalated situation so that they have more experience? Do you think that community policing, what do you think are some of the answers as far as relationships with police and communities of colors could be as far as making our city work for everyone? I think it's very important. Um, you know, there's different aspects to community policing. Some people like to say they have the officer that lives in the that area. Um, um, some people say, you know, to be there more often, mm-hmm. right? Uh, there is something else that we should also do. Um, you can have, instead of putting an officer in that area, uh, have the officers that currently live in that area be in that area. Right. You know, don't change them. Mm-hmm. Um, and let them grow and evolve with the community. And have an outreach program. Have a hub. Have something that bonds them um, besides, hey, here's your information on what to do next in this situation, that situation. You know, break bread together. Right. You know, that that is what's going to connect people uh, when they feel comfortable with you, that you, they actually feel that you are not just an officer, but you're a neighbor mm-hmm. or a friend. Right. And that starts uh, at a grassroots level. Yes, absolutely. And so I'm totally for um, community involvement in whatever form it is, whether it's law enforcement or an association or it's city council or county commissioner. Um, you know, I want to do town hall meetings. Nice. Um, when if I am elected, I want to also not just focus on associations, but I want to respect them. We have a lot of time. We have these uh, associations like Seminole Heights. They have a vision plan. You read their vision plan. Number one, I think, um, is walkable. Mm-hmm. But then you go to Seminole Heights. They've had nineteen crashes this year. Their vision plan didn't wasn't created last year. Their vision plan has been there for a while, and it's not respected. And we need to focus on our neighborhoods. They've had over 300 crashes in five years. One car, I mean, they had one house had two cars crashed in their home. Wow. Listen, you know, these are issues that we need to address. You know, the flood water that we talk, it's huge in South Tampa. Mm -hmm. I walk the streets in South Tampa. You know, everyone has the same issue. That you know, you know the flooding, mm-hmm. you know, the the driving, the the curbs, the you know these are things that we as a city can actually focus on, and that's what I want to do as your next city councilwoman. All right. Uh, well, we've completed the lightning round at okay. this point because, <laughs> um, like I said, <laughs> phew, um, you made that pretty easy. Um, and now we get to the fun part where if there's anything else you want to talk about your campaign, we're going to cover that. We're going to tell people how they can get involved. We're going to talk about the election. So um, in closing, is there anything else you want uh, listeners to know about you as a candidate or your campaign? I am an experienced leader with proven results. In transportation, technology, housing, and public safety, I add value to the table. If you want the same, then vote the same, and you will get the same. If you want change, vote for me, and I will bring you that change. Fair enough. (laughs) I like it. Um, 
So how can people get involved if people I'm, like what they're saying? My website is um, votevibacom uh-huh. My phone number is 813-789-5555. Uh, if you want to get involved, hurry up because we only have two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> are you hosting canvases, phone um, banks? I am, are hosting, you I've, I am hosting canvases. Um, please, uh, you can just text me and I'll give you a schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, I like to have, if you live in a certain area of Tampa, I, I would like to have the, I um, organize around you. Nice. Yeah. How about money? How? What's that yes. like? <laughs> Feel free to donate to VoteViva.com. <laughs> um, I do, uh, I would love to buy some more yard signs. <laughs> but um, yes, please, please donate. But more importantly, uh, please vote. That is free. Yeah, that's true. That is free. That is and free. tell me a little bit about the election. So we uh, were signed up to vote by mail, but we didn't get, or I'm signed up to vote by mail, didn't get a vote by mail ballot, which I've heard from a lot of people. Um, so I'm going to take advantage of early voting. Vote by mail is already out. Er- early voting starts Monday? Uh, February 25th. Is that Monday? This Monday, I believe? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Here I go. Let me check. And I believe hours have been changed. Yes. Oh, yes. And the hours have been changed. 10 to five i want to say yeah, less what hours it sounds like so make sure you get to uh the participating libraries if you haven't gotten your early ballot for whatever reason um i hate waiting till election day i know some people find there to be oh, I, I go for the sticker so, you get the sticker <laughs> even in early voting and i know i go give, for the sticker give my kids i know i have a collection of them um but please don't i mean if you love the thrill of voting on election day i get it but i would hate for your car to break down or your kid to be sick it yes. just gives me such a peace of mind to get it done over and know that yes. it's it's out of the way um because i hate i hate the concept of my voice not being heard um so early voting but election day is actually march 5th if for some reason you don't yes. make it to early voting um so you can go to your poll at that point and i think the last election only 10 or 11 percent had a voice um, about who they wanted to run our city. Um, I know on a uh, mayor years, I think it's been as high as 20%, but yeah. that's still less a, than 50% of Tampa votes. I mean, a lot less. It's a bet. It's a, it it's a not a good turnout. So please make sure that if you live in the city limits, you're, you're taking advantage and we have a, 18 charter amendments on yes. there, yes. which I think everybody has been said, please vote yes for. So, um, well, I think that covers it. Um, I hate, having such a short interview, but <laughs> I love the fact that you're concise and you know what you stand for and you have a clear message, not to say that other candidates <laughs> don't, but that's always refreshing. So thank you for your feedback. I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you so much for coming out here. Like I said, it means the world to me that uh, candidates have all taken the time to make sure that um, their voice is accessible and that people can hear their platforms. And we wish you the absolute best of luck in your campaign. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me, Jessica. And for all of our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in um i get so much uh kind of secret feedback from so many listeners who have so many positive things to say um it's it's an honor to be able to give you guys the opportunity um to to know what's going on in our town so thanks so much for listening um have a great day or evening or whatever (laughs) 